believe the House actually will be voting here any moment on Tax Reform 2.0 if they haven't already finished. So it's a, a nice segue into today's event. Uh, we're talking about reforming individual income tax and really the future of the individual income tax. Um, where do we see it going and, and what should uh, policymakers be thinking about in that space? Uh, I first want to thank H&R Block for helping us uh, sponsor today's event. Uh, this is the first of a series of talking tax events we'll be doing throughout the fall and winter in coordination with H&R Block. So thanks again for all of their help on this. Uh, for those of you here uh, and, and playing the live for the event, we have a hashtag, hashtag talking tax. Uh, feel free to add your comments um, and questions as well as some analysis of what you're hearing uh, and participate in that conversation. I'm joined here by an esteemed panel of tax experts to help us dive into this topic. Uh, in general, um, we are looking to answer three major questions. What is it that Congress actually did in December? Um, what does the individual income tax look like this year? Uh, and what will it look like over the next several years? The second, what did those changes mean for taxpayers? What are taxpayers seeing this year and what will they see next year when they file their first individual income tax return post-reform? Additionally, what does that mean for tax preparers? What are they seeing um, as we work through this, this large change in the individual income tax? In many ways, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was historic, but it's not perfect. And so we'll talk a bit about that as well. What does 2.0 mean to us? What should we be thinking about that? Where perhaps are there more opportunities for Congress and policymakers to make reform over the next several years to the individual income? And so with that, let me introduce our panelists. To my immediate right is Erica York. She is an analyst from the Tax Foundation. Erica's work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and a number of other publications. She holds a master's degree from Wichita State and an undergraduate degree in business administration and economics from Sterling College in Kansas. Next, we have Kathy Pickering, who is the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and Executive Director of the Tax Institute at H&R Block. Kathy has almost 20 years of experience in tax administration, and she's responsible for the strategic direction and management of, the team, of a team of the nation's top tax experts. She's currently focusing on an IRS security summit which brings together representatives of the IRS, state tax agencies, and industry to work on collaborative solutions to combat stolen identi identity fraud returns. And finally, Verity Drugi, who is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center. Vero is a, a nationally syndicated columnist and has testified numerous times before Congress on the impacts of fiscal stimulus, debt and deficits, and regulation on the economy. Her work has been featured in every major news outlet, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, CNN, and that list goes on. Um, she has her PhD from the Pantheon of Sorbonne University in France. So with that, I'll put it off with Erica to provide some initial setup for the conversation. Thanks, Nicole, and thanks everyone for being here today. I want to focus on three key points about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. First, that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act simplified taxes for millions of households. Second, that it delivers tax cuts to the average taxpayers in every congressional district and every income level. And third, that making the individual provisions permanent would be pro growth. But before getting to those points, I just want to take a step back and look at the individual income tax. Now, most of us are familiar with filing taxes, or at least we should be. Um, we add up our sources of income, and then we get to make certain adjustments to our income that either lower the amount we pay taxes on, or directly lower our tax liability. Now, under the old tax code, there were three primary provisions that reduced households' income taxes um, depending on their household size. These were the standard deduction, the personal exemption, and the child tax credit. The standard deduction, like it sounds, um, reduces a household's income by a standard amount, which depended um, if you filed single, head of household, or uh, married filing jointly. The alternate to the standard deduction is itemized deductions. These are primarily taken by higher income households, in which they keep track of certain expenses throughout the year, and if those total to a higher amount than the standard deduction, they would take itemized deductions. The second provision is the personal exemption. It's similar to the standard deduction in that it reduces household income by a set amount, 
but uh, generally one was allowed for each person in the household. And finally, the child tax credit, as it sounds, is a tax credit, depending on the number of children in the household, but unlike the other two provisions, this one directly reduced tax liability. Now, our income tax system is a progressive tax system. It has seven brackets, in which each bracket shows the tax rate that you'll pay on that portion of income. Now, it's important to understand reaching a higher tax bracket doesn't mean you pay that higher tax rate on all your income, only the income within that bracket. Now, completing all of these steps, figuring out your income, your adjustments, and your tax liability, created a large compliance burden. It was estimated in 2016 that it took individuals 2.6 billion hours to comply with IRS um, rules for individual taxes. Putting that in dollar terms, that's about $900 billion annually spent just on the time complying with the tax code. And that was one of the major motivations for tax reform. Now, in general, tax reform means cleaning up the code, so broadening the base by getting rid of um, carve-outs and exemptions and that sort of thing, and lowering rates at the same time. And that brings me to my first point, that the new tax law simplified taxes for millions of households. So the three provisions I mentioned under the old law were consolidated into two in the new tax code. The personal exemption was eliminated and replaced by an expanded standard deduction and expanded child tax credit. And this means that many powers will be better off taking a standard deduction instead of itemizing their deductions. The standard deduction was expanded from $6,500 to $13,000 for single filers, and from or to twelve thousand dollars for single filers, and from thirteen thousand to twenty-four thousand for um, married filers. So this near doubling of the standard deduction reduces the value of itemized deductions. To understand why, think of a married couple under the old tax code who would have taken fourteen thousand dollars in various itemized deductions. Under the new tax code, this couple is better off taking the expanded standard deduction of twenty-four thousand dollars because they get to deduct an additional ten thousand dollars. And they don't have to spend time keeping track of expenses, maintaining records, and filling out Schedule A of the Form 1040. So the Joint Committee on Taxation estimates the itemized filer, filers will fall from uh, $46.5 million in 2017 to just around $18 million in 2018 under the new tax code. So about 88% of all taxpayers will take this expanded standard deduction. We calculated that this will reduce the compliance burden of the individual income tax code anywhere from $3 billion to $5 billion. <coughs> the new tax law also features lower tax rates. It lowered rates substantially across those seven um, brackets. Together, we calculated that the structural changes along with the lower rates result in average taxpayers in every congressional district and in every income level receiving tax cuts. And the effects of that begin immediately. So for example, in my home state of Kansas, someone who makes between $50,000 and $75,000 will see a tax cut just over $1,400 this year. Now there's other provisions in the new law that are projected to increase the size of the economy over time, and this will boost pre-tax incomes for taxpayers. We don't necessarily see that this year or in the next few years, but by 2025, our dynamic estimates of after-tax income which incorporates that economic growth, are substantially higher than the conventional estimates which show. Now, as all of us here know, um, in 2025, the individual tax cuts are scheduled to expire. Even though taxpayers will be better off because of the larger economy, if the rates and the other provisions expire, this would result in widespread tax increases in 2026. So that's why Congress is considering tax reform 2.0, which would make those changes permanent. We've estimated that this would be pro-growth, it would increase the long run size of the economy by 2.2% in the long run and create 1.5 million full time equivalent jobs. So, to wrap up, the new tax law simplified individual income taxes by um, making reforms to uh, the family provisions. It also uh, cut taxes for average taxpayers in every congressional district and every income level, and making these individual provisions permanent would be pro growth. Thank you, Erica. <coughs> Thanks so much. I'm Kathy Pickering with h and Block, and so uh, my point of view will be talking about the individual taxpayer and their filing experience with regards to the changes in the Tax Cuts and Job Act. So, of course, the TCJA introduced the most significant changes to the tax code in the last 30 years, 
and virtually every tax filer will be impacted, as, as we were just talking about. And it impacts all types of returns, individual, small business, and corporate. I'm going to cover a couple of key topics that are specifically uh, focused on the individual taxpayer, and that's the changes to simplify the filing process with regards to the standard deduction and the new Form 1040, uh, changes to the credits and deductions, and then also the withholding experience. So with regards to the changes that are intended to simplify the filing process, we've already heard about the increase in the standard deduction, and you may have heard about the new Form 1040. Um, with the new Form 1040, taxpayers will no longer have to decide whether to file the Form 1040, the Form 1040-A, or the Form 1040-EZ. Um, and just as a reference point, the Form 1040-EZ is typically used in the simplest of filing situations. So you've got one W-2, likely don't have any children, it's a very straightforward filing. The 1040-A is for a little bit more of a complicated uh, return. You may be claiming some credits, like the earned income tax credit, things like that. And then the Form 1040, you would use uh, for example, when you're filing itemized deductions and those kinds of things. So now that's all consolidated into one standard form, simplified, streamlined process. However, the actual filing experience for taxpayers will feel very similar. Over 90% of taxpayers use software to prepare their tax returns, whether that's do-it-yourself software where they're preparing their own return or going to a tax professional where they're using tax professional software to prepare their returns. Um, at h and Block, we provide solutions across that whole spectrum, so we have a very unique view into taxpayer behavior, whether they're self-preparing or getting professional assistance. Um, the reality is that the tax interview remains the same. You still have to gather your income, you have to look at your household size, uh, look at your expenses for the year, you put that into the software, and then out of that generates your actual tax return, which prints the form. It's an output of the process as opposed to um, you know, sitting down with the form and calculating your return. So in that regard, the filing experience will feel very similar to taxpayers this year. Switching gears um, to changes in credits and exemptions, um, as, as Erica mentioned, the personal and dependent exemptions were eliminated or set to zero. And most notable is the increase in the expansion of the child tax credit. This has been expanded to $2,000 per child, with 1,400 of that being refundable. And what that means is that once your tax liability is set to zero, the rest of it comes back in an additional refund to the taxpayer. And so that increases your refund by that remainder. Um, and the phase outs around income have been significantly increased. So for a single filer, um, you can, uh, it goes up to 200,000 in income, and for a married filing joint, it's up to 400,000 before it starts phasing out, as compared to $110,000 for the current, you know, the, the, the prior child tax credit. So that's a significant expansion of that credit. Many more people will be able to take advantage of that. Um, and there was also the introduction of the other dependent credit, so that's for, non-child dependents or um, dependents age 17 or over that are living in the household. On the topic of the changes to the itemized deductions, um, just, just a little bit of an overview again of the taxpayer experience. Many home buyers believed that purchasing a home would drive significant tax benefits for them um, because they'd be able to deduct their mortgage interest, their state income tax, their personal property tax, and then by doing that, then once you get into the threshold of being able to itemize your deductions, you're able to then add on to that the benefit of deducting your charitable contributions as well. Um, so now, with the significant changes that have been made to the item to the itemized or the Schedule A, with that increase in the standard deduction, as well as the cap for the state and local uh, tax or the salt cap at 10,000, the benefit of itemizing will be limited for some taxpayers. Um, however, 
most taxpayers that are on the bubble are still going to have to calculate their taxes both ways. They're going to have to look at the itemized, they're going to have to look at the standard deduction and see which is better for them and then file accordingly. The good news is they have a choice. They get to do that. They get to look at which will be better for them and then pick that outcome. And then finally, just a quick overview on the impact of the withholding tables. When calculating the appropriate amount of withholding from your paycheck, there's a trade-off between simplicity and accuracy. And the new W-4 is more complicated than the existing W-4, so it requires a deeper knowledge of, um, of your tax and household situation in order to accurately calculate the withholdings. What we typically see is that taxpayers only update their W-4 when there's a significant change, such as starting a new job, getting married or divorced, or getting a surprise on their taxes. So um, that, would, that would be a catalyst to get them to decide to change their W-4 if they don't like the outcome when they file their taxes. So I think that we will see many taxpayers getting surprised in this upcoming filing season and making W-4 changes once they file their taxes. And so with that, just as an overview, I'm going to turn it over to Mary. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Oh, yes. uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I was uh, telling Nicole, it's kind of always intimidating because, like, like most people don't do actually deep dive into tax data, as we know that the data we always use is the tax foundation. So to be on the tax foundation panel, where I'm going to just be basing all my knowledge on what they write, is kind of. <laughs> Unsettling, but thanks for having me on the list. Today, I want to talk about um, actually three aspects of, of the tax reform: um, two wins and one loss, and and um, and then kind of talk about how that helps us think of the next stage for tax reform. So the first one is uh, definitely there's no doubt this tax reform um, that passed um, makes the tax, tax code less destructive. There were some aspects of the code that will definitely boost the, um, the economy, um, so, such as uh, slightly lowering the top marginal rates um, for people. Um, there are other aspects like uh, the changes to the death path and the mitigation of the uh, alternative minimum tax, these are definitely pro-growth um, you know, aspect of, and, and, and also, I mean, it's, it's, it simplifies a lot of the, of the burden, I mean, it's, it's a simplification, step towards simplification that we have all been advocating for. Um, I mean, there have been a lot of, I mean, no matter whether you look at um, market-based tax model for predicting growth or, or an even more Keynesian type model, everyone predicts growth. The question is how much, you know, what, you know how much growth you're going to get, I mean, there are debates about this, but the fact that this is generating growth is, is unquestionable. And, and I argue also that, um, and it's not just the individual tax, but it's the corporate income tax reduction, right? And the way some of these provisions are creating growth are exactly the right way to trigger growth, and 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 they're they going to be sustained way to create growth. So it's it's a good thing. Um, that being said, I mean it's not. You know, this is, we're not going to see miracle growth that, um, I, I don't know whether we could ever see miracle growth uh, rates, but, you know, this is, this is still a pretty modest um, tax reform. This is not the kind of thing that you would have seen if you had had a radical changes from a completely different system, like a consumption-based system, like a, a flat tax or something like this. And also, a problem was the way things were done. There were trade-offs that were made, I assume for political reasons, um, and, and, and for policy decisions that were made actually hindered the potential for growth. So for instance, um, we have a tax code on, on the uh, income tax that's very progressive. Um, based on your data, roughly 10% of the, the top 10% of income earners pay 71% or 70, let's say 70% of uh, the income tax. It's, it's, and there are like different measures to measure, um, there are different ways to measure progressivity. There's absolutely no doubt that the American income tax system is extremely progressive. However, the debate, as it was framed, uh, I think was completely misguided to make it a middle class tax cut required, considering how little 
of the burden of the tax they were going, they were already paying, would require to actually tap and expand the most unproductive with respect to growth aspect of the tax code, such as a, a child tax credit. And in fact, this is this is what what's happened. That's limiting the impact of growth that we could have had because it requires straight up in a constrained budget. You have to uh, choose. So we traded, you know, more middle class, non really growth aspect for not as much reduction of the top grades and things like this. Um, the other thing is because of some of the choices that were made, um, there were a lot of provision that had to be sunsetted that creates uncertainty, you know, and and um, and that has the potential to, to limit growth. That gives you a first hint of what would be, you know, the, the tax reform 2.0 would look like, it's like, Get rid of a lot of these uncertainties. I'd rather that they be for the, the reduction of rates uh, rather than the rates. But reduction of uncertainty is always a good thing. The second plus, I think, is that actually some of the important reforms, uh, so one of the really important reforms that we put in place, even though it didn't go all the way, was the reduction of the state and local um, tax deduction. And this is like a real potential to improve and better and give better incentives at the state level to implement better policies. Right? I mean we are I mean, we think about federal taxes, state taxes and all this, but we're you know we're an economy with like and, and the fact that definitely because of this change it's going to be um, it's gonna put a, a, a much more burden, it's gonna make state and local legislators much more uh, accountable for the kind of tax policies that they uh, put in place, I think this is going to, it's an important step um, in, uh, in restoring some fiscal responsibility. Now, I'm not saying it's going to necessarily result immediately in like all the high income um, state, income tax states to start or lowering their, their, their taxes, but they may actually slow down their, um, they're uh, resorting to tax increases. Who knows, right? I mean, and you can see this that as a really important uh, effect of the tax reform because you can see them fighting that aspect at the state level of the tax system. This, to me, is taking us a step closer than we were of having more competition between states, which is always a good thing. Um, there are a lot of reasons why we don't have enough competition, the size of the federal government, is one of them, and it's something that actually makes tax more um, more uh, painfully, the taxpayers more painfully aware of their tax burden at the state level is, in, you know, taking us a, a step closer to having more tax competition. I'd like to direct you to a new study by um, tax, uh, Chris Edwards at the Cato Institute that actually looked at whether there is, whether taxes actually contribute to inter interstate migration, and because uh, there's a debate, right, between to an expert of how much taxes at, um, count as having an effect on decisions to move, and, and he finds that it has an effect. So if it does have an effect, then this is going to kind of put more pressure at the state level. That's a good thing. And then the last part I want to talk about is, is a, a really an incredible loss. Um, and, and a missed opportunity, which is a failure to restrain the size and scope of government while passing tax reform. Because not only is it fiscally responsible, but on top of that, I think it jeopardizes the future of those tax reforms that will put in place in the, in the long run. So, I mean, the, 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 the debt obviously has been, and I'd like to say from the get-go, I mean, I, I don't, and it's absolutely incorrect to say that the financial problem that we have today are the product of the tax cut. I mean, like when you look at this, the difference between like the contributions to the deficit, um, no matter how you look at it, even look at it, it, like there's no dynamic effect and all this compared to the growth of entitlement spending. I mean, tax cut doesn't matter. That being said, everything that adds, you know, is, is a problem. And they like really, I mean, legislators are really just not, I mean, they're not just refusing to 
restrain spending, to control spending, they're actually adding, spending like crazy, right? And the problem with this is twofold. First, it had an impact on how much they could do in terms of reforming the tax system. It had an impact on, I mean, it forced them to resort to gimmicks like, you know, uh, sunsetting and things like this to make the numbers work. But again, I actually think the pressure the, of debt and large deficits in the long run, and then also carving out so much of the base of the, the income tax means in the future a call for higher taxes. And I, I think it's going to be, you know, the more you spend and the, le and the fewer taxpayers are there to actually pay. Now there's a payroll tax and all this, fine. But in the context of the income tax, I think I think it's going to put more pressure and on, on to lawmakers' ability to keep those taxes in place. And so I think really important part of reforming taxes <coughs> towards a system that be extremely pro-growth is to actually cut spending. Cut spending so you have the breathing room to do the things that you want to do. Even if you have faith of economic growth triggered by tax reform, it's going to have to work on paper. And if we don't do what we need to do on the spending side, it's, you know, it's going to be a problem. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, ladies. Um, obviously, we're, we welcome your questions in this to become a conversation. Uh, I'll take the moderator's discretion to ask the first one uh, to Kathy, actually. Um, so you mentioned that um, employees could be in for some surprises with their withholding changes. And, and the Government Accountability Office has looked at this and said that the aggregate numbers of over and under withholding is going to probably be constant this year over last year. Um, but that doesn't mean the individual taxpayer will be in the same position. So you know, from your perspective, what can employees do to help prevent surprises? What can employers do as well? And, and what are those things that people should be thinking about here as we, we enter the last quarter of the year? Great. Thanks for that question. So this is one of my favorite audience participation polls. How many people have personally looked at their own withholdings? Raise your hand. Better than, better than most groups. <laughs> um, so the, we are now in September. We've got one quarter left in the year. And um, the most important thing that any individual person can do is look at their current situation right now. So, um, you know, it's, it's, of course, if you're getting a paycheck, right, you want to look at you know, how much withholdings you've already, you know, uh, had withheld from your paycheck. Look at your situation. You know, understand your household. You know, do you have, do you have a, a, a spouse? Are they also working? Um, are they getting a paycheck with withholdings, or are they self-employed? And are they withholding enough? At this point in the year, it might be too late to make changes to your actual withholdings because depending on how far off you are, there's only three months left for adjusting your paycheck, and there may not be enough in your day-to-day -day cash flow to be able to make those adjustments, um, in which case we've also seen the IRS change their messaging, and now they're saying it's time to look at estimated payments and start calculating um, interest and um, penalties if you're under withheld. Um, so what we saw was with the changes in the withholding tables that went into effect in about February, a lot of people got a bit of an increase in their um, paychecks. So they were getting their, um, their benefit of the reduced uh, tax rates in their weekly paychecks. And so um, that's why it was important for people to look at their withholdings to make sure that they're getting the outcome that they want. We see that in total, you know, tax liability one year to the next, generally people will have a lower tax liability. However, if they've already gotten the benefit of that throughout the year, then they may not get the tax refund that they were uh, hoping for. Great, thank you. I think I saw a question over here. Yes. Okay, you know, you said that, uh, that you know, uh, you forget to check it, that the tax reform actually generated 1.5 million jobs. Okay, what areas will be the most plentiful you know, that those jobs will grow in 
And then you, after you ask that question, my next question is, okay, we as urban administrators, as policymakers, you know, on the school level, on the municipal level, on the federal level, and business-wide, what policies could you suggest to us to take advantage of those areas where you're going to have work job wise? Thanks for your question. So the 1.5 million jobs are what we project would occur if the individual provisions were made permanent. So the vote today, um, that's what we would expect in the long run to happen. As far as um, industries, is that what your question is about? Okay. As far as industries, we don't project that. Um, so, so I don't have an answer as far as what industries might be growing more than others. So you couldn't answer that question. My last question. My last question is. Uh, uh, for those states, you know, that have their tax code indexed to the federal, you know, if I got it right, you know, okay, on one hand, you know, we might be paying less to the federal government, but, you know, for a state like your own, you know, that might be indexed to the federal, you know, we might be paying them more. So what have your research showed that they're doing, you know, to mitigate that effect? Sure. So I'm actually going to jump in uh, and answer that question. Uh, so the gentleman is asking about what this term called conformity between the individual and the state income taxes. Uh, most states, for simplicity on the filer side and the administrative side, use the federal tax code as their base of taxation. And so what that means is that as the federal government has passed a fairly large restructuring of the individual income tax, state tax codes have been impacted as well. Uh, and in general, we think about the individual side of the tax cuts and job tax as lowering rates and broadening bases. Um, that means that while the federal government broadens the base to lower its rates, states can form on tax bases, but not on the rates. So in general, a state that conforms to the federal tax code is seeing a broader tax base this year with rates being held constant. And this results in an increase in revenue to those states. Uh, and the states that have reported this data, so about half of them have, um, all but two of them have forecasted an increase in revenue this year um, because of tax conformity. As to how states are responding, there are 50 states and there have been 50 unique responses. Um, in general, states have taken one of two approaches. Uh, the first, has been to actually engage in comprehensive tax reform. We've seen uh, more than five states pass comprehensive tax reform this year. States like Iowa, Georgia, Missouri, uh, because they had this increase in revenue. This increase in revenue allowed them to make changes they otherwise would not have had. And these increases in revenue can be significant. In the case of Georgia, they were projecting $5 billion over the next five years in additional revenue because of conformity. So this was an impetus. The other half of states are mostly in kind of a wait and see mode. There have been a number of states that have not projected out their revenue increases from conformity because they don't feel like they have enough data yet. Uh, and so they're kind of sitting back and waiting for you know, how to respond. Um, in general, the National Association of State Budget Officers has said that 25 states this year have engaged in some sort of con uh, conformity conversation, uh, but this will be a question for the next several years at the state level, is what do they do with this increase in revenue? Do they use it to fund uh, concurrent tax reform at the state level, or do they decide um, <clears throat> to, to increase spending, or you know, some combination of that? Uh, we've even seen states like Oregon has used part of the money that they've received to uh, go towards their pension fund, to help shore up their pension fund. So there have been a lot of state responses. We, on our website, actually have a lot of data about how states responded, and I direct you there. Yep. Next question. Yes, in the back. So when uh part of the tax reform, the corporate cuts specifically, was projected by a lot of people in like the sort of conservative think tankish world uh, to actually possibly create revenue because there was some speculation that the old rate of like 35% was slightly above the revenue maximizing rate for the corporate tax. And I'm just wondering if any evidence that we've seen so far from tax receipts has actually borne that out and whether or not we're gaining or losing revenue from that particular cut. Thank you. Vera, do you, did you have a comment on this? I you kind of touched on this a little yeah, bit. Yeah, no, I, I, so I haven't looked at uh, what's happening. I know there's, there's repatriation, um, which is one effect that was expected, um, you know, like money, um, stock abroad, 
um, due to the punishing you know, system that we had. Um, but I, I didn't look you know, closely at the data, but I think, I mean, Steve would be the best person to talk about this. I mean, all the projections for the adoption of the corporate income tax show and predict that there will be an increase of, um, of, of revenue as a result. Um, and, and, it, and it makes a lot of sense, especially going from the kind of system that was not just a high rate system, but it was a very distorted and punishing system. So we've moved away, not completely, but I mean, we, we've really gone in a, in a, in a direction that's you know, as favorable as, you know, uh, as we've seen in a long time to actually, you know, I think be assured that there will be more revenue. But I haven't looked, I mean, I think Steve would be really definitely the best person. Um, See me after. Bye. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Eric has got a couple things to jump in here too. Yeah, I, I have two points. Um, the first is that in general we, we wouldn't expect the tax cut to pay for itself. Um, the second point is that uh, the, we do expect growth to occur, uh, economic growth to occur because of the corporate income tax rate, but this is a process that takes time. So that's not something that we would expect to see immediately this year. Um, it'll take time for corporations to respond to the new rate, to plan investments for those investments to occur, et cetera. So that's, that's too soon to really uh, make a judgment on that. And I think it's also worth you know, pointing out that um, <coughs> And I think the reason why usually like everyone was supporting and clamoring for reduction of the corporate income tax rate is not it, it was because it was going to be transformative in the way people invest, right? And the best type of tax reforms are the ones that remove penalty from uh, working, saving and investment. And and this is exactly the way it's it operates when you reduce the marginal tax rate. And I think there's been a lot of confusion in the way people have been talking about the increase in bonuses you know, that were announced by the company as being a direct impact of um, tax reform and the reduction of the corporate income tax rate, and it wasn't. I mean, I'm not saying that there wasn't like an excitement that triggered all of this, but it will, as Eric has said, it will, it will take time but the way it will actually work is the way you want tax reform to work and by giving incentive to people to invest more. And this is going to pay off for workers because it's going to make uh, workers more productive and wages will go up. But it, te it, takes, a, it takes a long time. Question over here. Yeah, uh you made a lot of good points about the, the savings to individual taxpayers from simplification. But I just wonder if you could speculate on whether or not simplification will help the IRS in terms of its ability to administer the tax code as well, and whether there might be any savings or efficiencies uh, because of that. Kathy, that seems like a great question for you. <laughs> um, so, Certainly, with the um, implementation of just the one Form 1040 as opposed to three, um, that will simplify a processing stream. So now they only have to intake one um, instead of three. So we uh, we would expect that there will be some streamlining of processing and operations there, and. Um, uh, I, I, I would I would just have to say that because of the timing of the changes, I don't think we're going to see the benefit in this immediate filing season because there's so much work that needs to be done to get ready to implement it, and that this is probably something that would unfold over time. And certainly, the discussions that we're having about the you know the, uh, the possibility of permanency, you know, each year there seem to be. Um, a lot of changes and a lot of late changes, and that just uh, causes um, you know more work um, to be done uh, under tight timelines. So I, I think over over time, you know, we'll see the benefits of it. Um, but but this year is going to be a challenging year for them. Thank you. Other questions. Well, I'm going to do another. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Do you think the politics of the salt cap has been overplayed? I mean, it seems to me that so many people are going to get a tax hike. My Democrat friends tell me it's the end of the Republican Party in high tax states. So sort of talk to that. Uh, Eric, I'm going to be very Yeah, I, I think it's been mischaracterized. Um, the vast majority of tax filers are still better off because the cap to the salt deduction helped finance uh, rate cuts, helped finance the expansion of the child tax credit, and also helped reform the AMT. So we need to look at salt in context. Um, it primarily benefited high income earners, and a lot of these are the same that fell under the AMT. So the AMT would claw back the value of the salt deduction. Now that the AMT thresholds and exemptions have been increased, um, those filers will be able to take the capped salt deduction. Um, in terms of how it will affect states, um, the salt deduction does um, subsidize high income tax states at the expense of low income tax states. And so to the extent that it does that, it, it does reduce the, um, the effective cost of high taxes. But the change at the federal level doesn't directly impact state budgets. So state budgets are, are still the same that they were. Um, and, and as I've mentioned before, we calculated the average tax cuts by congressional district and by income level, and we see tax cuts on, on average in every single one of those. So. No, I, I would just want to say, like, I mean, if it's if it's the end of anything, it's not going to be the end of anything of any party. But if it's the end of anything, it's going to be the end of a bad incentive to shelter high income earners for the most part um, from the actual cost of the state they live in, and 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 that's a good thing. And and I think it's kind of the, since you talked about politics, I mean I am terrible at, at even understanding it, but it's kind of an interesting dynamic that we're seeing, whereas the Republicans constantly attack for sheltering high tax uh, earners doing something that actually you would think Democrats would cheer on, uh, you know, loud and. Um, Loudly, but they, they really aren't. So you have this very interesting dynamic right now where basically Democrats, um, for the most part, and, and, high, and, and to be fair, some, some Republicans in high uh, tax states are really upset about the hit that their high income tax, tax um, high income uh, earners are gonna are gonna get. Other questions? All right, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, um, my question relates to repatriation. Uh, so those corporations that have got that cash back, and it's basically expensive to balance the state, you know, creating an asset. How, what are the studies showing how they've deployed their working capital? Have they got that in stock, or have they, you know, uh, done some other things with that? Great thing that Eric actually released a paper yesterday on repatriation, so I'll let her uh, tackle that one. Yeah, so so again, the first answer is that it's, it's really soon. Um, we have six months of data on repatriation, and the new tax law hasn't even been in effect for a year. Um, but we have seen an increase in repatriation. Um, more more cash that was held abroad has been repatriated in the first six months of 2018 than in the past three years combined. So we have seen an increase in it. Um, as far as how corporations will use that cash, as I mentioned earlier, it takes time to plan investments and it takes time for those investments to boost productivity and for productivity to um, boost wages. We have seen an increase in stock buybacks. We've also got um, some great resources on our website about stock buybacks. We've got an interactive tool and um, a research paper, so you might want to check that out. But in general, um, we shouldn't think that stock buybacks come at the expense of investment. Stock buybacks can be a tool that supplements investment because they can transfer capital from old firms to new firms who are innovative, who are investing. And um, they also reward shareholders, as we know. Um, sometimes we don't think about shareholders, though, being uh, retirees, pension funds, the benefits, teachers, um, unions, and that, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, institutional investors, those types, are the largest investors in the United States. So when we think about who benefits from stock buybacks, it's, it's good to keep that in mind. Great. We're running a little low on time, so I'll ask the final question, but I'll ask all three panelists to comment. So the House either has just voted or will vote here in the next few minutes uh, on that final bill of tax reform 2.0. Um, but this obviously is a conversation that will continue on. The Senate is not expected to debate this bill anytime in the near future. So as policymakers look ahead uh, in the next, the next several Congresses, 
What should they be thinking about with the individual income tax, and what would your recommendation be on the form? I'll start with uh, Vera, and we'll work over this way. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to be obnoxious, and I'm going to say that actually really, I mean, if, if they're thinking about taxes, they really shouldn't be doing any tax reform except for bettering the structure of the code if they're not going to be cutting spending. Because as much, I mean, I like tax cuts as much as the next, next person, maybe more even. But our my, my government is small, and, and the size of government is measured by how much it's, it spends and not how much it taxes. And it always backfire. I mean, it's like these two things are connected, even though we talk about them separately. And I, I just, I, I mean, I, I really, I really don't think anyone that there was there was a lot of talk last time around that like the middle class deserves. A tax cut. Well, no, actually, no one deserves a tax cut if we're not going to be controlling the size of government. And this is still true. And and um, I think there are always it's important to uh, to um, like uh, simplify the structure, and that could cost some money, at least in the short run. But um, uh, but I I think no, we don't deserve a tax cut if. No one deserves a tax cut if we're not going to be cutting spending. So from the individual taxpayer perspective, um, I, I think the most important thing is the certainty and the ability to plan, whichever, whichever way it goes, um, just for the taxpayer to be able to take advantage of whatever incentives are put into the code, um, knowing that they will be in existence for a predictable period of time to be able to plan for that, take advantage of it, is is um, going to be the, the most important thing. And so that's what you know we would would hope for is that there's um, uh, you know time to plan and that the legislation is passed. Um, early enough so that people know that it's coming. When things get passed in December, effective in January, it's very difficult for that individual taxpayer to really be able to take advantage of that. I think going forward, lawmakers are going to face an increasing challenge of weighing the trade-off between permanence and revenue. I think they should prioritize uh, provisions that, that provide the most growth or the most economic benefit for the least cost. Um, one thing I would note is that reforming the three family provisions that I mentioned, the standard deduction, personal exemption, and child tax credit, is almost a revenue neutral trade off. Um, and then I would echo what Kathy says about certainty, um, not waiting until the last minute to decide what to do going forward would, would be important. Great. Well, think, think, oh, see? <laughs> Yesterday, the Commerce Department released the second quarter figures on changes in asset holdings by us here and abroad and by them here and abroad. And uh, I'll try and grab that graph to answer some of the questions about whether repatriation is occurring quickly or not. It, it, it's, it's quite a demonstration that in the last two quarters a huge change has occurred. I'll try and lift the graph and see if I can put it in a blog. If it comes out of their report, it goes in a blog. Uh, it should be either early today or early Monday. Thank you. Uh, so thank you to everyone who joined us here in the room, as well as everyone uh, on Twitter on our hashtag Talking Tax. As I mentioned at the beginning, this will be a series of events we'll be holding throughout the fall and winter in coordination with h and Block. So thanks again for their sponsorship of today's event. Uh, and then finally, Erica and our panelists talked about a great deal of data about the impact of the changes of the, of the tax cuts and job tax on, on you individually and on your constituents. Um, we, on Monday, will be releasing new landing page consolidating all of our research on the topic, uh, be sure to check out at taxfoundation.org slash TCJA for tax cuts and jobs act. Thanks for joining us today.